Resurrection Day in the church is a story uh, where we all really know the ending already, but we want to hear it anyway, because it stirs something up in our souls. And as a church, we've been working through the Gospel of John for several months now, and today we are going to look at chapter 20. If you want to turn there, you can go ahead and turn there. Um, you should know that if you're sort of jumping in right now with us, you are getting into the story at the end, and that's okay. Uh, there's been a quite a bit of backstory that we've seen so far. Jesus had made claims to be God in the flesh. He supported his claims with incredible miracles and authoritative teaching that the Jews had not seen before. In addition to this, John also presents Jesus as a sacrificial lamb that would somehow remove the sins of the people. Exactly how was it quite figured out until the end? But as we saw, Jesus arrested, nailed to a cross between two criminals, it became clear that would be how. Last week, we heard Jesus cry, it is finished, from the cross. He bowed his head, he gave up his spirit, and Jesus did die. And that was on a Friday. They took his body, they wrapped it in cloths and in spices, and they laid him in a tomb guarded by Roman soldiers under the seal of Pontius Pilate. His body was laid in the tomb on Friday, and all day Saturday, up until daybreak of Sunday morning. I would imagine things were pretty dark in Jerusalem at this time as news traveled around. I would also imagine things were pretty dark in the hearts of Jesus' followers. If you think about Peter, John, James, Mary, Martha, everybody that threw down a palm branch and said, Hosanna. Uh, their teacher was dead. The man that they woke up and asked, hey, what are we going to do today, was dead. The object of their hopes, their dreams, their ambitions was dead. The man after whom they patterned their life was dead. They, especially John and the women, saw the body. They, they watched the crown of thorns pushed into Jesus' head. They watched him be scourged and whipped. They watched him carry his cross and struggle his way up to Golgotha. They watched the nails pierce his hands and feet. They watched the struggle for breath as he slowly died on the cross. They watched the soldier plunge the spear into his side and saw the blood and water flow. They saw the body be wrapped and placed in the tomb with a heavy stone covering the entrance and guards standing nearby. Saturday came. They were more than sad. They were crushed. This was an existential crisis of reality for them. But in time, they would... They would probably remember Jesus fondly. They would propagate his teachings in the synagogue. They would do their best to remember Jesus in their hearts. Uh, they would always wonder what he meant maybe by, I'll, I'll destroy the temple and raise it in three days. But he had all sorts of other teachings that they could cling to. They would probably visit his tomb every Passover. Perhaps build a monument there where he died to his memory. That was Saturday. And friends, the Saturday ending is the same ending for every major religious leader and founder the world has ever known. We remember the teachings, we marvel at the movement, and we visit the gravesite. But Christians already know, and as we have already read, and as we've already sung today, Jesus' story has a different ending, a unique ending, a powerful, victorious ending. Because the cry of the Christian is not he is remembered, but rather he is risen. And it's because of this radical difference between a dead religion and a living faith that I want us to explore the implications of the resurrection today. If you're a follower of Jesus already today, I want you to experience the riches of a living and active faith because we have a living and active Lord. And if you're an outsider to the faith, a skeptic investigating things today, I want you to ask this question. What if this really happened? What if this story is real? What if this occurred just like the four Gospels and the writings of Peter and Paul and John and the early eyewitnesses and the ones who died as martyrs rather than denounce this story said? What if it really happened? If the resurrection of Jesus happened, there are meaningful implications for the life of every person here today. Whether you're skeptical and exploring from the outside or if you're a believer that just needs some passion stirred up inside you, the resurrection can speak to you. It's Easter Sunday morning. If this happened, everything changes. I want to begin with prayer. Would you pray with me? 
Father, we ask boldly right now that your spirit would move in this room, that you would stir us up. Lord, that you would show us the power of your resurrection today. Lord, if there's one that struggles with belief, Lord, would you just invade their heart and cause belief to happen today by your power? Lord, for our, the believers that know this story, would you stir us to love this story, to cherish this story, and to apply it all year long? Lord, there are implications here if this happened. Help us to dive into those today. May you receive glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I can think of no better way to use up a couple of minutes of my sermon than to read the text. So, um, John 20, why don't we go ahead and go there. Um, chapter 19 left us with a dead body in the tomb, a very confused and saddened group of followers. So 20 is really where things get good. Let's read. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that's John, FYI, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must ride from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept and stooped to look into the tomb, she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. That's the conclusion to the gospel story right there. It's pretty amazing. I have four implications from this story that I want to bring out to you today. First, if this really happened, we have a legitimate Lord. If this really happened, we have a legitimate Lord. This was an exercise I gave our community group on Wednesday night. Um, I said, uh, as we were all sitting around, think about what would change in your faith. I don't want you guys to take the exercise. Just don't talk back at me. Just think about it. What would change in your faith life if everything in the gospel was true up till the resurrection moment? Jesus did all the miracles. He said all the things. Everything happened. The cross happened just the way it is finished. Head bowed, spirit, wrapped him, put him in the tomb. But everything after that, the resurrection did not happen. What would change in your faith? Kelly, I'll, I'll give you credit, Kelly, in typical fashion, leaned back in his chair and answered and said, I think you got nothing. <laughs> and I said, so for you, it's a house of cards. And, and if this one card is pulled, the whole thing crumbles down. And he said, yep. <laughs> and so let me just say, I can't agree more. If Jesus was not raised, we have nothing. Listen to this sampling from 1 Corinthians, because I know some of you guys are like, I don't know, I, I might still come to church. I might still do the thing, all right? Listen to 1 Corinthians. I've got a sampling of verses for you. If Christ was not resurrected. Paul talks about this. He, he, he goes through this. If Christ was not resurrected, um, if Christ had not been raised, in verse 14, first he says, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. This means our Sunday gatherings are an absolute joke. My job is a joke. And any time that you spend gathering for Bible studies or praying at home is a joke. 
You're wasting your time if Christ is not raised. Next, he says, if Christ is not raised, then we uh, are found to be misrepresenting God. So he's saying, you've told a lie. You've gone around and lied about this. And you said God's done something he has not done. In verse 17, he says, if Christ is not raised, then your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. Now, that's a big deal. This is a big one. Your salvation is incomplete without a resurrected Christ. Death would have had the final word because it was not defeated. God could not stop death, which are the wages of sin. That's why you're still in your sin if there's no resurrection. Then he says, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. That means your loved ones that are in Christ that have passed, if there's no resurrection, that's just it. You will never see them again. We die, go into the ground, the planet wears out, our sun burns out, turns into a red giant, engulfs us, and we're all done. I don't know when it will happen, but that's it. Someday, it'll just happen. We'll be done. If there's no resurrection. Next, he says, if in Christ we have hope uh, in this life only, then we are a people to be pitied. Paul is saying here, we should actually be pitied, made fun of, of all people in the world. Because our entire worldview is built, our grand hope is built on a lie if Christ is not raised. If Christ is not raised, we have an illegitimate Lord, a false Messiah, like so many other wackos and weirdos and narcissists that have come and gone. Jesus claimed a lot of things about himself, right? I mean, he said he was going to do this. So if he didn't do it, that makes him... A liar, right? His followers claimed a lot of things about him. John the author said he was the word at the beginning. John the Baptist said he was the lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. If Jesus was not raised, he is a liar. But if this really happened, if this really happened, well, I got four things for you if this really happened. Jesus was, number one, exactly who he said he was if this really happened. The skeptic now has to go back and read all the Gospels again, assuming every single word to be true. He is the bread of life in the wilderness. He is the light of the world, the gate that leads to green pastures, the good shepherd of our soul, the resurrection and the life, the true vine and the way, the truth and the life of which no one comes to the Father but by him. It's all true. Every word is true. Next, if this really happened, Jesus was endorsed by God as his Messiah. See, only God could raise someone with creative, life-giving power. For God to raise Jesus was an endorsement of everything he had done. All his ministry on earth, the connections to the Old Testament are now true because it's God's man that he put forward. That means that Jesus was the man of sorrows from Isaiah 53. He was the ram caught in the thicket in Genesis 22. He was the Passover lamb whose blood was smeared on the doorpost in Exodus 12. He is the rescuer promised to crush the head of the serpent in Genesis 3. And he is the lamb standing as if slain in Revelation 5, only worthy to open the scroll. If this really happened, number three, the cross worked. The cross worked. The sacrifice was eternally effective. Every year, thousands of bulls and goats and lambs sacrificed as an offering to God. But something had to change to end the cycle Wash, rinse, repeat, you know, sin, sacrifice, repeat over and over and over. But what ended the cycle? Well, what ended the cycle was the lamb talked back and said it is finished and came back to life three days later. You can be saved from your sins and trust in the effectiveness of the cross because of what Jesus accomplished there. Because the resurrection affirms it. This is the beautiful thing about the resurrection. man. Imagine if it didn't happen. We just have to say we just got to take him in his word. But there is eternal proof. That he was who he said he was. If he didn't, if he didn't do it, we just have to wonder. And I, I guess I trust him. I mean, I don't know. It seemed like he knew what he was talking about. They were miracles. I mean, but coming back from the dead just makes it all work. Number four, if this really happened, we can have a right relationship with a holy and righteous God. As Jesus hung on the cross, yes, he endured physical pain, but he also endured the wrath of God for sin of every believer. Of all time, every bit of holy anger that God stored up against sin was unleashed on his sinless son, redirecting that anger away from you. That's how you have the relationship with God. Jesus took all the anger for sin on himself on the cross and he cried out. That was the pain of feeling the weight of 
billions of sins and shame that he took for you. A lot of time is spent in our media, I think, in, in sort of this pattern. Our really political culture works like this. You determine an agenda and an outcome. You look for news that drives that agenda. And then you report stories that confirm that agenda. And if there are those that don't confirm it, you twist those stories so that they do confirm it. Right? That's how our news works. The Christian faith is the exact opposite of this. Our faith starts with a story, a fact, an eyewitness report. Jesus was verifiably dead and now alive. And then ask the question, what does this mean? What do I do with this, with this fact? This was the bedrock of the early church preaching. It had changed worship from the Jewish Saturday to the Christian Sunday. It empowered scared disciples to go face down Rome and preach until they were killed. Jesus really was resurrected. And his resurrection stands as the evidence that demands a verdict. Because you must do something with this info. If, if it really happened, we have a legitimate Lord. God has visited us in the flesh. Everything he said is true. Let me tell you something about what I do when I experience doubts. I know you're like, yeah, you don't experience doubts, but I do. I do. Not you, Jerry. Yeah. Um, sometimes you feel you feel doubts. Like, man, what if this whole thing is just made up? Like, I just I just bought it. Hook, line, hook, line, and sinker. Like a fool. What if this is all made up? You know? You think about that sometimes. Whenever I'm in that place, I think about the resurrection. Did it happen or not? Because that makes everything else true. If it happened, we have everything. And there's no doubts. Because you can't fake a resurrected Lord who said what he said and did what he did. If the resurrection happened, we have everything. Let me tell you something. If it didn't happen, we have nothing. And I will give you a bit of wisdom. If it did not happen, you need to leave right now and go live your life exactly how you want to. And you need to acquire as much wealth as you can. And you need to take whatever you can. And you need to live for yourself. Get all you want, can all you get, and sit on the can. Die with the biggest pile of toys and have the most fun you possibly can have before you die. And don't even feel bad about it. Because if there's no Jesus, we just evolved creatures that climbed out of the slime. But if it happened, we already have everything, and the God of the Bible is the living and true God, and Jesus is Lord, and we have the privilege to live for him. We have a legitimate Lord. Next, I want to see, we also have a significant story. We have a significant story, and I'll just add one more thing. How sad would it be if you believed in the resurrection and then lived as if it didn't happen. How sad would that be? Don't be that person. Number two, we have a significant story. I want to go back into John 20, 1 through 10. That's where this is going to come from. I'm just going to uh, skim through it. Because this is a really interesting game of tag. I always thought this story was funny growing up. I don't know if they meant it to be or not, but it is. So John reports that Mary Magdalene was first on the scene. Sees the empty tomb. The stone was gone. Jesus is gone. Verse 2 says she immediately ran back to look for Peter and John. Where's Peter and John? i got to tell somebody. What's happened? And as soon as she reached Peter and John, verse 3 and 4, they hear the news, and then they take off the other direction. They sprint. She runs and finds them. They run uh, back to the tomb. They're in a, a dead sprint. And I've always loved this because they're running to the same place, but John does not wait for Peter. There is no, like, hey, man, we'll run together. Come on, big guy. Like, no, there's none of that. He leaves him in the dust and gets there first and tells you in the text that he gets there first. John's like, looks like you shouldn't have had that second helping at the Last Supper there, Petey boy. And he just keeps running. And, uh, and so they both get there. Peter's dry heaving probably like Joe at 10,000 feet trying to run through the snow. And, uh, you know, you've got the linen cloths lying there. You've got the, the face cloth folded up. And the seal on the tomb would have been broken, Pilate's seal. The guards are gone. The, the stone gone. Everybody's just in shock. What could possibly have happened? And so I want you to ask now a personal question. You know, you kind of have that story there, the really exciting back and forth drama. Here's a, here's a question that's going to step away from the text a little bit, but when was the last time you got really excited about something? When was the last time you were moved to tears by a story? 
When was the last time you laughed so hard that you cried? When was the last time you felt passion for something meaningful overtake you and move you? The reason I ask this is because in our world today, it seems like to me it's getting harder and harder to feel. Uh, it's like our constant exposure to media has dulled our, our pain and pleasure senses. Nothing really gets us riled up anymore. Nothing really uh, makes us sad or happy. It's just uh, everything is sort of getting crunched down to just a zombie mode, it feels like to me. Uh, because there's a lot of people searching for significance in this life. Most people want to do something that matters, something that fills them. They've tried a lot of square pegs and a lot of round holes, and it just doesn't seem to fit. Now, I want to go back to our text and take this idea and pose another question to you. Do you think if I, let's say, 20 seconds into Mary's sprint back to find Peter and John, or 20 seconds into Peter and John's foot race back to the tomb, if I just pop out of the, the bushes, jump in front of them and say, hey guys, <laughs> how crazy is it when sitcoms just replace the characters right in the middle of the season? Like, we're not supposed to know that Aunt Viv was gone from the Fresh Prince. Come on. What happened to Judy in Family Matters? She just goes upstairs and you never see her again. Am I right, guys? Am I right? <laughs> do, you, do you think in that moment they're going to stop and just chit-chat with me? Like, man, that's a solid point. That shows about 2,000 years in the future, but still, solid point. Uh, of course not. There's, because there's nothing more pressing in that moment than the news that Jesus is alive and resurrected. There's no time or desire to divert attention from the most important news in the world and waste time chit-chatting. And church, how quickly we can become distracted in our lives. And I know we've heard this story before, and every Easter it's like this challenge to make the same story cool and exciting. Well, let me just tell you, if you're at the point where you need to be excited by this story, then you're so saturated in it, you need to go tell someone else about it. Because that's the best way to cure I'm bored with Bible is to go tell someone else about it and they'll be excited for the first time. And guess what? You get excited because they're excited. Then they ask you questions that you never thought about before. So if you're like, man, I'm so bored. We just do every week. I've heard it all. I got, uh, come on, preacher. Give me something. Show me something new. Give me like, you know, 10 Kings deep in, in the first Kings. Like, I'll, give me some new stuff. It's like maybe you need to take the gospel yeah. and go to people that have never even heard that before you worry about the 15th king and 2nd kings and the, the depth of that name. Um, I, that was not on this page. That was just me talking. And so um, this is a really significant story. And if you're looking for purpose in life that will enliven your passions and give you purpose, I, I think what you do is you look at Mary in this text. She wanted Peter and John to know that the tomb was empty. And she didn't waste any time. She was on a mission to find them. And I'm guessing she was feeling very fulfilled in her run to go and find them. In the resurrection, we have a story worth telling that we were made to tell. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen, some of you guys may have, uh, some of you may have done this, and so you're forgiven. A, a dog, that's a working dog. You know, a dog that's got bread with a purpose. You know, it's supposed to hunt or it's supposed to pull a cart or it's supposed to, you know, herd sheep or something like that. You know, those dogs that are just, if they're not doing it, they're, they're angry. And so maybe you've seen a dog like that and you've seen them tied up for a long period of time or caged or left inside or something like that. It's amazing the difference in their happiness when you take them out and let them do the thing they were made to do, right? Yes. You take that dog out, you know, that's only job is to just pull a cart and you're like, that would be no fun for me. I don't want to go pull a cart. But you, you put it on those, that dog's shoulder, and they're just pulling it, and they're just happy. It's like, man, this is what I was made to do. Yes. But when you leave a working dog inside or tied up without using that energy, they become frustrated, depressed, start chewing on things, becoming aggressive or doing weird things, like just spinning around for no reason. When a Christian neglects the mission of running to the world with the gospel, we have our own version of caged frustration. Because that's why you get dumb fights in church. That's why you see competition for the best band and the best stage design. That's why you see churches trying to entertain themselves with programs that have nothing to do with the mission. Because when you're not engaged in what you were bred to do, you just start chewing on things, messing with the sofa, spinning in circles like a fool. We have a significant story to tell that fulfills us. 
Even as we hold jobs that aren't ministry, that doesn't mean anything. Jesus gave us something to run about. We have a story worth getting winded over. When's the last time the gospel got you winded? The resurrection gives us meaning because there's a story to tell until the whole world hears. We have a legitimate Lord. We have a significant story. Third, we have a different direction. A different direction. Now, I do want to turn your attention to the text, verses 11 through 18 of chapter 20. Now, remember at this point, Mary Magdalene had seen just the empty tomb, but not Jesus yet. So she just saw the shell. The disciples went back, and then she's now back. And so Mary is sitting at the tomb crying, still probably not knowing what happened to the body. Let's read this together, verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels sitting in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. One at the head, one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they've taken away my Lord. And I don't know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, just tell me where you've laid him and I will go and take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And that's when she turned and said in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. So this is a really cool moment also because we get to see the eyes of Mary opened in the text. Uh, she went from the shock of an empty tomb to the possibility that the body was stolen to the reality that Jesus, whom she watched personally die on the cross, was alive and talking to her. And, and he must have looked much improved. He looked like a, a good looking gardener, apparently. And so that's where I want to draw your attention. If the resurrection really happened, just like Mary, Jesus can wipe away our tears and hurts just in a moment like he did for her. Because it's, it's amazing what a change of news can do in your heart, for your spirit. Some of you guys are sports fans. You've probably been through this. I've been through this before. Um, you're watching a game, and you're absolutely certain your team's going to lose, so you turn it off early. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to bed. You're at the stadium. You're like, I can't be hurt like this anymore. My heart is too soft. And so you go home. You get in the parking lot, and then maybe you turn on the radio. They're coming back, you know, and, you, and you're like, what have I done? And you, or you wake up the next morning and you're on Sports Center and you find out they came back and you didn't watch it. You were a disloyal fan. You didn't stick it out. Oh, and you're wrong. And uh, it's, it's just crazy to me in a moment because I've been there. I remember doing that at an Orlando Magic game, actually. But you can, uh, in a moment, you go from just, I, I'm this depressed person because my team is terrible. They can't win. To... The world is now a bright and colorful place. Wow, we have the best team ever. Boy, we knew what we were doing. We had them right where we wanted them the whole time. That's what the empty tomb can do for you. You have a different direction in the blink of an eye. Listen to what David wrote in Psalm 30. I love this verse. He says, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth. And clothe me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praises and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Jesus does that for us. He takes our most desperate situation and turns our mourning into dancing. When we learn that there's a purpose in this life, that there's meaning beyond the suffering. The Apostle Paul was a Christian hating Pharisee. And he was doing everything possible to stop the church. But in a single moment... In one moment on the road to Damascus, Jesus appears, and his entire life changed in a moment. You say, well, that can't happen to me. How do you know? How do you know that? When you learn that the tomb is empty and God is real and that he is actively working things out for your good, it changes things. Mary was crushed, heartbroken, teary-eyed, focused on the pain. But the resurrected king resurrects our hope and our purpose Look at what Revelation 21, 4 through 5 says. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. When we know that death is just temporary, that Jesus is Lord over even death, we have a new direction in life. We don't lay around in our sorrows and our sadness. Do you think that Mary stayed by that tomb 
and cried after she saw Jesus alive? Mary, Rabbi, boom. Hold on, Jesus. I got some more crying to do. You go on and tell the fellas. Of course that didn't happen because that defies logic. If the resurrection really happened, we have a different direction. Not made to sulk and weep by the empty tomb as if the body is still there. But we were made for joy as people who have touched and seen the resurrected body of Christ. The empty tomb shows us that things can change for the better in a single moment. Your sorrows are just one move of God away from joy. And it is the power of God that we cling to in our pain. Because if God can raise Jesus from the dead, there is nothing beyond his reach in your life. The resurrection gives us a legitimate Lord, a significant story, a different direction. And lastly, if this really happened, we have a favorable future. A favorable future. I was involved in a funeral last weekend. You guys remember? I kind of did the Willis Reed show up at the last second and uh, jump on stage last week. Um, I know most of you have attended funerals before, and there's this moment, you know, where you approach the casket. Of, the open casket is always just makes everything more real, and you see the body of your your family member or your friend, and there's this sweeping finality of death. Just something comes over you that's like, this is, I mean, there's no, there's nothing. We have had every moment we're going to have. It's over. And as humans, we start just searching for words to say. We look for comforting platitudes. We grasp anything that we can say to soften the reality of death. And let me just tell you, I've been involved in funerals and I've watched them and I've talked to you guys that have been involved and there is a significant difference between the death of a believer and an unbeliever. There is a serious difference, and that difference is called hope. Christians don't have to make sense of everything because we can trust in a sovereign God and that the same God that raised Jesus can also raise us as well. The Christian hope is not that we live a good life and follow Jesus' teachings until we die. I want to free you guys from that. If you thought that was it, that was not it. We do not just follow Jesus and die. The Christian hope is that we follow Jesus and die. And then when Jesus returns for his second coming, he will raise us to resurrected bodies just like the one he had and usher us into an eternity in his presence, worshiping forever. And when you become a follower of Jesus by faith, you are in union with him. That means that, yes, you die to self like he died. You're raised to new life as he raised to new life for the forgiveness of sin, but also because he raised to a resurrected body, you will also be raised to a resurrected body. As Jesus goes to the Father, so you will go to the Father in eternal fellowship. You will enjoy each other's presence for eternity. The Christian has hope in this life and in the next. Which the cry of Easter is, oh death, where is your sin? Hell, where is your victory? Jesus has dealt the death blow to death. And when he walked out of the tomb alive, he showed it has no power. This is why we have hope, because our death is temporary. A mere footnote in the eternal joy that we will receive in Christ. And we have a living God and a living hope. Our God has proven that he can do miracles and is intervening in our world. Now, there are some that will say that God is real, but is not involved or is distant, not concerned with us. The only way that you can ever believe in a God like that is if you deny Jesus completely. Because Jesus is the ultimate intervention of God into his creation. He came in and walked among us and died at our hands to save us from our sins. He robbed the grave of its power by a miraculous defeat of death. And we have a living faith, not a dead religion. This week as we watched uh, Notre Dame burn on the news, I listened to some of the reporters. I was there when it broke, and I watched them struggle to talk about it. Now, most of these anchors were Catholic, so keep that in mind, describing the events that were unfolding. But as they were grasping for something to say, it was as if a person was dying, the way they described it. And listen, I respect the history and architecture that was lost. It was a beautiful historic building, and the Disney movie is great. 
But listening to the reporters and people interviewed sounded as if they were in a crisis of faith. People were crushed by what they were watching. It was as if they watched their own faith burn to the ground on TV. Abby walked by me and, and we were, I was watching the news and um, we were just listening to, I think it was like Shepard Smith or somebody, just really struggling to come up with words. And the tone of his voice was as if someone was dying and we were watching it. And she said, uh, wow, how many people died in, in the fire? I said, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone died. I, I think it's just the building. And, and it was very strange because uh, it, the way they had framed it was that so much pain. I was then reminded of a different story. About one month ago, I heard this, and I made a note of it in case the illustration ever came up. Um, the Chinese government has been cracking down on churches that refused to register with the government and put cameras in their buildings to be watched. Um, they recently targeted a church of a thousand people by seizing all their goods inside, just took everything. They put locks on the door so they couldn't get in, and they carried off people to interrogate them for hours and hours. The pastor's been on house arrest for months, and they asked the church, what are you going to do? They said, we will continue to meet and operate while adjusting our meeting venue and methods. Just another day in China. And so I took those two stories, and I thought about them, and I think it's almost representative of two different faiths. There's a living hope, and there's a dead religion. One clings to tradition, routine, facilities, history, and relics. The other clings to the gospel and the people of God. My hope is that you would not live your Christian life as if the resurrection never happened. As if Jesus is still in a tomb or still up on a cross that we can visit. As if this is all just about following some nice teaching. Our faith is living and active because our Savior is living and active. His word is living and active. And because the resurrection really happened, there are meaningful implications for your life. Let me review the four for you. Jesus is the real deal, exactly who the Bible said he was. We have a story to tell and a purpose for our lives. He turns our tears into joy and our new life as we receive it. And we have a living hope and a favorable future in the resurrection that we share with Christ. If this really happened, everything changes. And you can't live as if it doesn't. May God grant us the eyes to see the truth and hearts to worship him in light of that truth. Would you pray with me?